welcome everyone to another interview with the Room for Discussion. A little bit of a badonkadonk. Let's see. Is it good? Yeah, maybe. Okay, yeah. wonderful. So our guest today is here to discuss status games, and those are the games we play in life to rise in social ranks. So whether you are playing to be the best student in your studies, or if you're playing to be the best drinker at your borals, uh, you definitely want to win. So what happens, though, when you lose these status games? And what happens if Whoa. One more second. Yeah? Okay. So, and what happens when you're kicked out of one of these status games entirely? There's an old African proverb that provides the answer. The child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. The agony of rejection and the humiliation of losing means that we find ever more violent, ever more extreme ways to win the game. Our guest today is an award-winning journalist and author. Please welcome Mr. Will Storr. Thank you. Thank you for that. Let's go. Please, if you want to take a seat. Take a seat. Okay, let's see. Welcome today to the UVA. We're super excited to have you here on the stage. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Um, we were wondering, actually, why did you decide to join us today for this interview? Why did I decide to join you today for the interview? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I like talking about the subjects in the book. I, I, I thought, uh, when you asked me, I thought I'll probably fancy going to Amsterdam in January because nice January's time. depressing nice and it's a nice, nice place to go. So, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> to, to begin with, I think it would be great if you could just sort of briefly introduce the thesis of your newest book. So what is a status game? So the status games are the, 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 the kind, of, kind of one form of the games we play in life. Um, it, it's based on some um, new, sort of relatively new findings in psychology, which finds that kind of our need for status um, is a fundamental um, kind of universal human need. It's like a psychological nutrient, like we all need to feel of value to other people. And when we don't feel of value to other people, when we feel relatively low in status, we get depressed, we get physically sick. Um, so, um, you know, a big part of human social life is trying to earn status. And, and so, so the book is, is this kind of, hopefully kind of fresh look at how human life works, but from the point of view, from this very sort of particular point of view. Right. And what, what is status? So status is simply the feeling of being of value. Okay. So I'm a valuable person, so people see me as good at something, as useful in some way. You've said in some uh, previous interviews that there are three main types of status games. Yeah. So could you just explain what those are? Yeah, so um, if you look back through our kind of history, <laughs> um, um, th th there are various different kinds of ways that we can play status games and earn status. Um, if you go back millions of years to before we were human, most of the games that we played, like most of the games that animals play, are about dominance. So it's physical, it's aggression, you're kind of playing status games with, 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 with sort of teeth and claws, um, like, like hens. When hens meet, they peck at each other until a pecking order is established. So that's dominance. And we still, you know, we still do that today. We haven't erased the dominance uh, from our minds. We've only got to look at Russia, Ukraine to see that dominance is still a way that we play status games. Um, but it's not just physical violence, it's also bullying, the threat of bullying, the th ostracization, name calling, all that stuff. So whenever we're kind of forcing each other to attend to us in status, that's dominance. Um, but of course, that's not all, that's, that, that's, you know, we do a lot more than that as humans too. Um, and the big change is when we kind of came down from the trees and started living around campfires in big communal groups. Because when you're living in big communal groups, you can't just go around beating each other up all the time and threatening each other. So we started playing games of reputation. And so, so, so you began to earn status by proving yourself of value to the tribe. Hmm. So there are two ways of doing that. One is by being virtuous, so by being a morally good person, by being selfless, by sharing your meat, by helping, by being courageous in battle. Um, uh, but also by enforcing the rules and knowing the rules <laughs> and believing all the sacred beliefs. So that, that's how you rise in kind of virtuous status. And if you think about life today, the Pope is a global superstar. Of course. But it's all about virtue. It's yeah. all about, you know, and, and, and royalty is a kind of virtue game too because it's all about mm. the rules and knowing the rules and believing 
these stories that these are special people and calling them your highness, you know, that's all <laughs> that stuff. And then, of course, there's competence, you know, like the, the other way you can be useful to your tribe is by being really good at something. So right. being a, by being a, a, um, a good hunter, a good storyteller, a good sorcerer. Um, so dominance, virtue, and success, that was human life 20,000 years ago. It's also human life today. We've still got the same brains, so we're still playing the same games. Um, I feel sometimes when you look at these things, so if you're uh, the winner at a success game then, for example, yeah. and you become a big CEO, um, if you meet one, they are also usually quite dominant, uh, and it feels like the success gives them some sort of dominance. So how are these uh, categories like intertwined? Well, um, th yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly some of them are, like, but, but not all of them. I, th I, you know, I, I think it's important not to kind of confuse... So, you know, so when, you're in the, when you're in the company of somebody of very high status who's whose high state is in your game, which means that they've got power over you, then you can feel intimidated by them. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're using dominance. Um, uh, but, but, but it's also true um, that there's no such thing as a pure game. So you can think of, well, boxing is a, is a dominance game, and it is. But of course, there's lots of rules to boxing. You can't go around and kick someone in the crotch in the middle of a boxing match. <laughs> so, 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 so there's virtue in there too. And there's also competence. Like You've got to be really... That is a, I don't know what it is, but there's some sort of skill to boxing, isn't there? I don't know what they yeah. do there. Yeah, Ducking and <laughs> doing that. I don't know. So, 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 it, so it's a dominance game, but, 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 it, but it, you know, it also has all this other stuff kind of blended into it. So, and I think that's true of all games, really. It's like they, they, there's usually a, a top note, like a, like a soup. There's a dominant flavour to a game. Oh. Um, but but, but there's, I don't think there's very, any such thing as a really pure game. There's, there's always uh, all these other, other kind of ways of earning status blended into them. Okay. So could you give us some examples maybe of games that we or our audience play in everyday lives? So what status games do we play? Do you okay, so, so, so when I'm talking about a status game, well, um, it, 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 it's a group. Right. So, 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 so because we're groupish, because we're tribal, because our brain's evolved in this tribal context, the brain is always wanting to do the same thing over and over again, the human brain, and that is to form into groups mm -hmm. and to use them to play status games. So a group is kind of like a tribe, but, it, but it's always a status game. So if you think about um, Catholicism or communism or um, a chess club, like, yeah. it's all the same. It's people forming into groups, and in, within that group, there's a hierarchy. And, right. and, the, and the, better, the better you perform in that group, the higher you go up the hierarchy. Yeah. And, and then, but then but we also play group versus group games. So, you know, football is an example, obviously. So at the end of a football match, you might get man or woman of the match, the best player. So that, that's the person who's earned the most status within that group. But of course, there's also a winner of the, of the match. Yes, game and, and, you know, that's true again in politics. That's true in, um, um, you know, all, all domains, really, politics, um, you know, between the business sphere. So, 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 so you know, the, the, the classes that you're going to, the lectures that you're going to, in a way, they're status games. You, you'll be aware in that room that there's some people up there, there's some people down there, and you'll be aware of roughly Wait. of your position in, the, in, in that room. But also, you know, the, the, the way that, that, that human status games are, you might ask a great question in that, um, in that session and leave feeling right up there. Like, I'm the king or the queen. <laughs> uh, but equally, you might ask a question that everyone laughs at and goes, oh, God, what an <laughs> idiot. And then you feel down there. So we're constantly, you know, right. jostling and moving. How do we tell where we are on the status game? It's really difficult, and that's why we're so chippy about it as humans, right. because you can't own your status. It's not like, like this glass, you know, like it's like you can't see it. Yeah. And so, so, so um, status is given to us by other people. It, you know, like, we, it's, it's, it, like, like it, we, we sense it in the way that we're being treated by other people. And the brain has this, psychologists call it um, a status detection system. So, so we're constantly mm. measuring and sort of assessing where we sit vis-a-vis -vis other people. And so the brain is, 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 is always looking at things like the amount of eye contact you're receiving from other people, and, 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 it, and it judges that with numerical precision. Oh. Things like um, um, uninterrupted conversation, like the more you can talk without being interrupted, the higher your relative status in the group. So, so it, it just doesn't end, so, and, and that's why we get so chippy. That's why, that's why we have road rage, and that's why we feel bad on Bondi Beach with our tops off, yeah. you know, like, because it's, it doesn't, it never ends. We're constantly, this mission, it's like an always on technology, this right. status detection system. So what if I, uh, so I recently started painting a little bit and yeah. I'm not really good at it. <laughs> so I would just do it for enjoyment, not mm. because I am trying to, or I know that I will not be um, good at it compared to other people. Yeah. So where does that fit into uh, the status games? Okay, so, 
Sure. So, so, so I, I'm not arguing that sadness is everything. So, so pleasure exists, and the pleasure in painting is, is, a, is a real thing. But I'd also suggest to you that if somebody that you admired as a painter looks at one of your paintings and went, that is really amazing, <laughs> you'd feel great. Yeah. That, That's yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Probably won't happen, yeah. though. <laughs> well, you never know. <laughs> okay, so um, I was also wondering... Um, your conceptualization of status, do you think that that's a, a novel idea or is it something that we've kind of seen throughout academia and stuff throughout history? Oh, it's not a novel idea. No, I didn't come up with it. No, it's based on obviously lots of research from other people that have been studying it. And um, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. So what kind of research goes into writing a book like The Status Game? Oh, man, uh, this, just... This book was just endless reading, really. Yeah, must have. Yeah, so all my previous books have been lots of interviewing and right. in the field research, but this one was just sort of, cause, because this one's just based around an idea. Yeah. I got this idea about the status games, you know, and so, so, so it's about like a, reading a broad range of books to try and. Where did the idea come from for status games? Okay, so um, uh, the book before last I wrote was called Selfie, and it's yeah. about the Western self, and it's about like kind of Western self obsession. And for, as part of that, I interviewed a a psychologist called Professor Bruce Hood. And um, I was interviewing him, and he, he said to me, um, he didn't use the word status, he used the word validation. Mm. And he said, oh, um, you know, why do we do all the things that we do? He said, why do we, you know, once we've got enough money to, you know, live, to be safe and look after our children, everything else is just about validation. You know, why are you writing this book? Why do we buy yachts? And, and when he said that, I immediately kind of felt a bit like... That's a bit cynical. That's a bit like yeah. that's not true. But it really played on my mind, and I think it played on my mind because I just like it, I just felt like I, when I thought about it, I thought, you know, yeah, I think it, I think it might be true. Like I really think it might be true. And then the other the other thing was that I was reading the book Sapiens because mm -hmm. everybody was said you've got to read this book Sapiens, and I and I, and I, and I resisted reading it for a long time <laughs> because, just because it was irritated. <laughs> and, and 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 one of the things that he that he wrote in that book that people was always telling me about was this thing about Peugeot. And he said that, that like a company, like an organization, yeah. is, um, is a story. Yeah. Um, a, a, and I thought, it's not a story. Like, who's the hero? Like, it's not a what is it? I, I didn't agree with him that it's a story. Like, what's the plot of Peugeot? Like, what's the beginning, <laughs> and the middle, and the end? And he says that, you know, if you just remove all the people from Peugeot, Peugeot would still exist. And I, so, and I thought, well, I, if, if, if Peugeot isn't a story, you know, what is it? And then that was my answer that I came to, was it's actually a, it's like a, it's like a status game. Like, that's what it is. It's a tribe. Right. And, and, and all tribes have these same properties, which is that they're these games that we play for status. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, so you also uh, argue in your book that uh, this need to play status games is innate in humans yeah. uh, and innate in society. Mm -hmm. And you already mentioned it briefly, but what are some ways that uh, it has changed throughout history, the way we play them? Oh, okay. So... Um, yeah, so, 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 so the big picture is obviously dominance was the, was the thing up until we became human. Yeah. And, and what defines us really, well, one, of, one of the things that defines us as humans is, is this, that we play these games of reputation. We, we, we play for prestige. Uh, the, the other big change was, um, um, happened here and also in, the, in, in, in Britain um, was the Industrial Revolution. Mm. Um, so up until really for the most of human history, yeah. we were mostly playing dominance games and virtue games. So if you look at the pre-industrial revolution world, it was all about religion and you know, monarchy and war. And, and so most people who weren't in that kind of royal cast at the top were really living pretty awful lives. Of, you know, they were heavily religious. So, so the religious status game it kind of plays a cruel trick on you, really, because it says that you're going to get status if you play the, play the game, but you've got to die first, and then you're going to get to heaven, and you're going to get, it's going to be amazing. You're going to be up there sitting next to Jesus. <laughs> so, 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 so everybody's believe in this and going, oh, great, you know, if I go to church and, I, you know, and I'm a good person, then I'm a, I earn my status that way. So they were, they were kind of heavily kind of virtue games. The virtue games are kind of backwards looking. Um, they're, 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 they're kind of, you know, they're all about kind of conformity and knowing your place. Um, and then, you know, the Industrial Revolution changed everything because, you know, th th there came this new, well, not a new way of playing, but like a, th this idea that, um, um, that, that we could earn status by discovering something new, by, 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 by discovering new and useful knowledge. That was the amazing idea that became 
the Enlightenment, the Scientific Revolution, the Industrial Revolu Revolution. And, so, and, and then what that led to was um, the, the, the success games overtaking virtue games. Yeah. That led to social mobility. And, and the, you know, initially, it was only sort of men. But now everybody, in theory, can start there and end up there by playing success games, by, by proving their value to um, society through their competence. So that was because of the Industrial Revolution, and now that we're sort of living through a digital revolution, yeah. do you think there's a similar change happening? Um, I, don't think it, I don't think it's anywhere near as radical, okay. but I, I, think that, I, I, I think that it's, you know, social media, is, you know, it's been an extraordinary success. It's become a global phenomenon. Like the, the, the most recent statistic I saw that more than 4 billion people are using social media, and that's more than half the population of the world. And you think about the amount of people who haven't got internet access, who are too young or too old to use a smartphone, like that's incredible that four billion people are on social media. So that to me says it's, it's connecting with something really fundamental in human nature. Right. And I think, you know, part of that thing is connection. You know, connection is, I don't talk about that much in the book, but it's equally important to status. But also it is status. When you think about, um, those three games of dominance, virtue, and success. Well, that's Twitter, isn't it? That's Facebook, yeah. that's Instagram, that's TikTok. <laughs> that's what it is. It's people pushing each other around. It's people showing off about their kind of how virtuous and they're about, you know, talking about their beliefs. And it's also people showing off about their, off their competence. Like, I've won this award. I've look at my lovely holiday, look at my house. So, so, so yeah, it's, it's become this whole new universe of status games. And that's, that's kind of what social media is, I think. And that's why people become so attached to it. Okay, but so what about in societies where you have a completely different structure? So, for example, uh, you know, matriarchal societies or non-capitalist or just a communal parenting style even. Yeah. That, those type of things. Do we still uh, see the same three types of status games? Yes. Yeah, you do. I mean, I mean you know, where you go around the world, you, you, you'll see different emphases. And, and I think the, the emphasis on success games, you know, is very much a creation of Western culture, individualist culture, and it's now spreading around the world. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, even if you go back to, you know, so-called egalitarian tribes, pre-modern tribes, they're not egalitarian because everybody in them doesn't care about status. They're egalitarian because they, everyone cares very much about status. Mm. And there's a huge number of social checks and balances that are in play to make sure that nobody rises too high, you know. So, 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 so yeah, wherever you go in the world, people are deeply interested in, in their own um, rank in the groups, even if a lot of that is unconscious. So what would then success look like in a, in a non-capitalist structure, for example? Well, you've still got to be competent in a non-capitalist structure. Like, if you, even if you go back to the early years of the Soviet Union, when they were trying to practice the purer form of communism, which didn't last very long, um, you know, e e even then, you know, look at the art, look at the painting celebrating this factory achieved this, you know, grain production, that's status, you know. So, 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 so and, and in fact, that's, you know, like the final chapter of the book um, is the story of, the, of communism. You know, I'm telling the story of communism and why it didn't work because, um, you know, communism is, is a really great example where you had these people um, who, who, who thought, well, let's try and create a culture that doesn't have status in it. Literally, we just wipe status out. And, and, and they decided that what the cause of status was private ownership. So because if you've got this house and somebody else has got this house, you're going to feel bad. And why should you feel bad? You've got a house. Like, it makes sense. Yeah. Like, you can understand why they thought it. But the, but the mistake was it wasn't private ownership that creates that status craving. It's, it's in there. So you can't get rid of it. And, of course, that's what happened in the Soviet Union. It just ends up being... In, I mean, in the 1950s, some sociologists went over there and they found 12 distinct social classes. <laughs> you know, it's just that they'd flipped it. So the proletariat were at the top and the board was even at the bottom. Yeah. And that's what happened. And that's what happens in all attempts, as far as I can see, of utopianism. Mm -hmm. They, they, they try and get rid of hierarchy, but they just flip the hierarchy so the utopians are now at the top. Right. <laughs> and the former bosses are now at the bottom. And, you know, that's, that, that happens all the time. Okay, so what are the benefits of actually winning the status game then? You can't win it. You can't win the status There's game. no winning of it, no. Okay. Like, it's just endless. Like, like, so so, so, so that's, the, that, that's one of the kind of mirages that the brain spins us. Um, there was a really, um, there, there was a really um, interesting study that I talk about in the book where um, one set of psychologists interviewed um, 
a bunch of millionaire, multi-millionaires and yeah. billionaires, and, and they asked these people, how much money would you need to be perfectly happy? And they said, uniformly, they said, between two and three times as much money, and I'll be perfectly happy. <laughs> and, and that's what we all think. We all think, when I get this, I'll be yeah. happy. Yeah. And it, it's kind of the brain kind of cajoling us and pushing us along. But it's not true. And, and that's, the, that's the kind of like horror of the status game, really, is that we always feel like the next thing and the next thing, we're going to be happy. But of course, we're not. You know, we, we all know that yeah. when we think about it logically. We, we're happy for about, you know, 35 minutes and then we want to do the next thing and the next yeah. thing. And so, you know, that is depressing, but it's also functional because it, it keeps us pushing boundaries. It keeps us improving and keeps us improving, keeps us improving. So, so it's also I, a good thing. For, I, it's a good thing for humanity. So I get that it's a good thing for humanity, but yeah. as an individual, <laughs> is there any benefit to actually trying to do well in the status? Yeah, of course, it's just huge. That I'm yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 there's no winning it, but earning it, uh, you know, it's it, it, it's the same now as it was twenty thousand years ago. Like if you look at the tr kinds of tribes that we evolved in, yeah. the more status you earn in that tribe, the um, the, the better food you get, the more food you get, the safer your sleeping sites, the better the conditions of life for your children, the more children you have, the greater your access to your choice of mates. So basically, everything gets better when you earn more status in those, those, those groups. And that was, right. you know, true, again, true 20,000 years ago. It's also true today. So it's this basic rule of the human brain, you know, unconscious, which is go for status. Because if you go for status, everything else gets better. And that, and that, and that remains true all over the world. So are there any, um, you mentioned a little bit like you get better food and stuff. Are there any other, uh, I know I read some studies about health benefits yeah. actually, uh, yeah. status. Uh, are there any health yeah, benefits? Yeah, I mean, this is one of, the, one of the studies that really convinced me that I should, that, that there was something in this kind of thesis. So th th there's a guy in the UK called Dr. Michael Marmot. And he, um, he um, did a big investigation in his team of um, Whitehall in the UK. And Whitehall is the civil service. It's the big bureaucracy that takes all the stuff a government wants to do and makes it happen. So it's huge, hierarchical beast of an organization. <laughs> and what they found in Whitehall was the, was the higher status, the better your health outcomes. Mm. And so, you know, you immediately think, well, that's because they, they can afford yeah. a personal trainer in a gym and they can eat better food. And, it, and, and that's just not true. It's like literally one step down from the very top and they've got slightly less you know, worse right. health outcomes. And everybody working for the civil service, apart from maybe the cleaners, you know, they're, they're living okay, they're safe, they're secure, yeah. they can afford things. Yeah. Um, so, so it wasn't that at all. Um, uh, it, was, it, it was finely kind of degreed, uh, you know, that down. Uh, and, 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 the, and the changes were significant. So middle-aged middle people towards the bottom of the hierarchy had, uh, a four, uh, had four times the chances of dying than the people at the very top. So they're really significant. Mm. And so... Um, uh, that this has been found, you know, cross-culturally. It's been, been found uh, for men and for women. And um, what clinched it was that they, they, they sort of recreated this in the laboratory with, with monkeys. So they got all these monkeys, and they fed them a terrible diet, a delicious but terrible diet of pizza, <laughs> chocolate, lovely stuff. Um, and, and, of course, the, 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 the poor monkeys got um, a high levels of, of atherosclerotic plaque, so they, 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 you know, they, their bodies started going wrong. And what they found was just like in, the, like in Whitehall... The, pe the monkeys at the top of the hierarchy were less likely to fall sick as a result of their bad diets than the, the one just down. Mm. And even more significantly, when they conspired to alter the hierarchy of the troop, mm -hmm. the health outcome shifted. So, so now this monkey, if you put that monkey there, that monkey's now less likely to get fall ill. So, 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 so yeah, it has, it has significant health outcomes. Okay, so I mean, as great as success sounds then, um, yeah. it sounds pretty bad if you're at the lower end of the yeah, hierarchy. It is, is there yeah. any way to kind of stop playing or just exit the game? You can't exit the game. Like, it's impossible. Like, I mean, you know, as the communists discovered, I mean, so there, 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 are two, <laughs> there are two ways that people try and exit the game. And one of the ways is um, you, you often hear about mindfulness meditation. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I'm sure that works to a degree. But there was also, it's actually um, a university, I think it was University of Amsterdam study, or it was oh. definitely the Netherlands, but there was, a, there was um, a, a psychologist from this part of the world who studied 3,700 mindfulness meditators, specifically ones who meditate to reduce their ego needs, uh, which is kind of a bit like status. Uh, and they f she found that these people scored very high in what she called spiritual superiority. <laughs> so, so the better they got at mindful meditating, the, the more kind of, they, they started feeling really good about themselves. So, so, so I thought that was really funny. Uh, and then the, the other way, of course, is you just shut yourself away. And I think there's half a million people in Japan 
hikikomori who mm. just withdraw. And of course, you know, they're, they're, a lot of them playing computer games, which is a status game, and they're not very happy. They often die alone, and not, their bodies aren't found for like months on end. So, you know, it's not really, it's not really possible because it's just, it, it's a fundamental part of the human operating system. Like, you've, you've only got to, to meet somebody in a lift, mm. and you're playing a status game. Like, you're unconsciously. Yeah, doing that. With Who's that going person. to the highest floor? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Who's got the best luggage? Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's not possible at all to leave the status game. So what's the best way to play the status game then? So yeah. should I go all yeah. in on being like the strongest, sexiest <laughs> man in the room, no. or should I also try to get decent grades? Okay, so so the first thing I'd say is to, is to understand that there are kind of limitless games. I mean, that's right. the amazing thing about human beings is that we are incredibly imaginative. We're incredibly resourceful. We're so obsessed with status. We'll play status games with glasses of water on the table. Like, like you can, there's limitless games you can play. So even if your career isn't going well, there's lots of other things that you can do to... Because we're, what we're really talking about, I think the mistake that people make with status is they think I'm talking about money or fame. Mm. It's not about money or fame or being good looking. It might be about those things if you're lucky enough. Um, but, 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 but it could be a million other things. You, know, you could right. be volunteering. You could be saving lives on, on the phone with the suicide helpline, literally saving lives. So, so there, are, there are infinite ways of playing status games. So, so, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is to play, I think, multiple games. Like, like uh, the, the, psych the science is pretty, pretty robust that the more games that you play, yeah. the more stable you are emotionally, the happier you are. And I, and I think that's because you've got various sources of status. I think the dangerous thing to do is, is, is especially what, what people do when they're in their 20s and 30s, you know, for good reason, is that they put all of their status into one thing. And, 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 that, and that makes a lot of sense in a way because you're building, you know, and you've, you've got to get to a certain place before you get middle-aged, you know, <laughs> because, because then your, 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 your options start becoming more limited. So, so, so I, I think, yeah, go for it in your teens and 20s, but broaden it out, you know. When, like when, diversify when you, when you your get, risk. Yeah, diversify, yeah. because... Um, uh, because you need lots of different sort of, like, you know, hedge it. Hedge right. it a bit. <laughs> and, and I think especially when you get older, you, 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 I def, you definitely see in it when people get sort of above 60, say, yeah. they seem to become less interested in, like, competent status and more interested in mm -hmm. virtue status. That they, 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 people seem to shift between... Uh, uh, and, and maybe, arguably, less interested in status overall. Like, it, it feels okay. to me, and I couldn't find any studies about this, but it feels to me that when we get to a, a certain age, we become less interested in status and more interested in sort of connection and community and all that other stuff. Do you have an idea about why that might be? Um, well, um, I have seen work that looks at the role of grandparents in tribes, and, you know, um, the, the role of the grandparent is, has always been really important in terms of wisdom and knowledge. And so if we've been doing that for millions of years or tens of thousands of years, then that's going to be, that, that, that's going to be in our kind of you know, wiring that's mm. going to be something that we're born with. So, so, so that might be, you know, part of the reason. And, and, and we do know for sure, we lots of, there's lots of work that's looked at adolescents and people in their 20s. Okay. And, and people in, adolescents and people in their 20s are, are super interested in status. That's when it all kind of switches on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll really that right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So yeah. we've introduced the basic concepts here, and yeah. we would like now to open up to the audience uh, for a couple of questions. Do we have any at this time? Oh, yes, we do. Okay, wonderful. Um, Patrick, could you do the lady in the middle? <laughs> Hello. Um, nice to see you, first of all. Uh, thank you for the interview. Uh, I was wondering, even though I, I think I'm, I might know what your answer is going to um, go for, uh, how do you view altruism? And uh, if you think that... Uh, motivations for actions is driven solely by status, or how does altruism fit into um, your thesis? Thank you. <laughs> well, you, you probably know what I'm going to say. So, you know, the, 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 the standard evolutionary kind of explanation of this, again, is about value. That, that, that um, when we became these highly cooperative, highly communal species of ape, there had to be an incentive system to benefit the group you know, before ourselves. So selflessness, you know, the, the, you know, like universally, selflessness is seen as a, a, as a valuable trait. When somebody acts selfless, that we see them as heroic and good. So, that, so we rise in status. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I think that's, that, that, that's, you know, a lot of what we, what we see as purely selfless 
I don't think it's purely selfless. I think there's, a, there, there, there's an incentive there. And you can feel it yourself. Like when, like nobody has to watch you giving money to somebody uh, to a good cause or doing something. You can do it on your own and you feel, you feel good, you know. And um, sometimes that, that comes across as sounding a bit cynical and a bit depressing, but actually I don't feel that way. I think the fact that our species has evolved um, a, a powerful reward system that rewards selfless behavior is amazing. <laughs> it's like the very right. best of human nature. It's the wonderful, wonderful thing. You know, like after the COVID pandemic, the, the, the women that invented the British, the AstraZeneca one, mm -hmm. there were celebrities that were on the magazines and da da da. And, and, and that's great. You know, like, like that, that's great that it was this kind of instant instinct in our society that wanted to make these yeah. heroes and celebrities elevate with these, them, elevate them. Yeah, and that's, them and that's good. It's good that we do that. You know, it's good that we do that. So, so, so yeah. All right, one more question. Let's go with the gentleman in the scarf. Uh, hi, hello. Uh, hi. Um, so I must confess that I have not read your book, so I don't know if you maybe talk about this uh, in there, but uh, can you maybe explain how countercultures uh, uh, entered the status game? So why uh, in some... Uh, decades there is a sort of uh, feeling for younger people to sort of uh, rebel against mm. uh, the established uh, culture and norms and why sometimes that doesn't uh, seem to be present. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, that's an interesting question. So, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that every game has its own rules. Um, uh, uh, so, so um, you know, the status game that Buddhists play um, it's different versus the status game that people on Wall Street play, obviously completely different. They're all playing for status, but Wall Street is about how much money I've earned. Buddhism is how much I can live without and how much I can deprive myself of or whatever it is, you know. So, 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 so and, and I think, I also think sort of kind of generationally, there's always this, um, um, not always, but, but there's often a kind of movement away from the parents' generation. And so, and I think a lot of it is down to the adolescent brain again. So, so, so when children hit around 13, 14, a specific part of their brain begins to expand, which deals with the need for status. And that's why adolescents have this kind of paradox, apparently paradoxical suite of behaviors. So that they're both highly risk-taking, but they're also get really embarrassed easily. And that's because they're, they're, they're suddenly playing status games for real, adult ones that aren't dependent on the family. Um, and, and, that, and that's why they're, you know, they, they join peer groups, because that, that's what a peer group is. It's a new status game. Um, you know, in my day, it was all about music. You're a goth <laughs> or a rocker or whatever you were, you know. Um, so, um, so, so, so and, I, and I think kind of inherent in that is coming up with your new status game that is... Uh, separated from the parents' generation, so so uh, so, so uh, like it doesn't always happen, as you say, but but I, but I think there is this kind of, kind of kind of biological basis to the idea of adolescents pushing away from the status games of their parents. Like if they, you know, like the, the ways their parents are playing for status has got to be different from the way they're playing for status. Otherwise, they haven't pushed away from the kind of family group. Thank you, and thank you for the audience you. questions. Uh, if we have time, we'll also have another round later on. We'll see. Um, so I just want to give a little warning. We might, uh, for the next section, touch on some more sensitive topics like self-harm and mental health. So just beware, and if you're uncomfortable, you're, of course, welcome to leave. Um, so, hi again. Hi. Uh, we also wanted to turn our eyes a little bit more on uh, men. Yeah. For one section's interview, you've written a lot about uh, men's issues and men's suffering. Uh, in modern society, not only in your books, but also in your articles and press journalist history. Um, but we were wondering, do men and women react uh, differently to losing status games? Um, well, you've got to sort of, yeah. So, so the first thing to say about gender is that you, you're always generalizing. So, 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 so when you're talking about the difference between men and women, it's always a generality, because that's the, that's the only way you can talk about groups. So, so you, you're kind of stuck doing that. I think one of the most kind of reliable findings in psychology um, is about preferences. And this is found, again, all around the world in large numbers, and the difference is big. And that is that, on average, and again, as a generality, men, men are interested in, in things, and women are interested in people. And so um, that's inevitably going to have a big impact on status games. 
because it's, you know, in, in the free parts of the world, we're free to choose what, what we do when we go to university, when we leave university, when we go into the workplace. And so if men are more interested in things in general and women are interested in people in general, it kind of predicts that you're going to get more men in some areas and more, more women in other areas. And so if you had a tractor factory, for example, that's exactly the book is so basic, but if you had a tractor factory, um, you might well find there are more men than women working in that tractor factory. And the, and the reason for that wouldn't be because the bosses of the tractor factory are sexist. Possibly, probably, potentially, it's, 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 it's just as likely that it's just going to be that there's more men interested in tractors than women. Mm -hmm. so, so, so that's one of the sort of big kind of um, ones that are... That there's, there's, that's most well evidenced in psychology. Mm. Okay, so then um, if you have these two differences in preferences, mm. for example, uh, and you play a, a maybe more than thing-focused status game, uh, let's say a success game, mm. um, again, would there be like a difference in uh, reaction from uh, the men who end up on the bottom of the social hierarchy then compared to women who end up on the bottom? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. So, so, so are you saying about how, how, how different genders respond to being low status? Yeah. yeah. Um, own, well, the, the only one that I know about for sure is um, what I talk in the book about humiliation. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I'm arguing that status is a fundamental human need, and we all need it, and we're very chippy about it, and we don't like it when somebody takes our status away. <laughs> so... As part of my investigation, I wanted to find out um, what happens when, what happens like in, in, the, in our, on our worst days when our status is taken away. And I found, out this, found this paper called Humiliation and Its Consequences, which was all about that. And, and their definition of humiliation was, it's not, it's, like, it's not just the removal of your status, right. usually in a sudden way. It, it's, the, it's, the, it's, it, it's the removal of your status that's so severe that you feel you can never go back to that game again. That you're gone, you're banished. So everybody fears humiliation, uh, you know, um, it, because it is, it's that sudden, horrific removal of status. Um, and so, and there is a difference between the way men and women kind of respond to humiliation in that men are far more likely to go to violence mm -hmm. because men, in, on average, are far more violent than women. And then you've only got to look at, I mean, it's obvious, you know, <laughs> you've only got to look at the statistics, the prison population, it's just true that, that when it comes to dominance, mm -hmm. men go to violence, um, um, and men are built for violence, men have the physique for violence. Um, still, even after all these, you know, tens of thousands of years of evolution, men are still more muscular, and more, more kind of physically prepared for physical co conflict. Um, so, so, so that's the big difference. Uh, and in the book, as, as you know, um, you know I, I argue that the most dangerous people on earth are males who are narcissistic, and humiliated. You, you, that, those three, that combination of those three things, male, narcissistic, so you feel you're entitled to high status, but um, it's taken away um, from you in a, in a very public and um, 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 painful way. These people are highly likely, relatively speaking, to go to violence and sometimes right. mass violence. Because you've talked and you've worked a lot with these sort of extremist groups in the past, especially. So mm. What's the connection between humiliation and the decision to join an extremist group? Um, well, I suppose um, extremist groups are the ones that feel... Um, okay, so, so, so there's a story that all tyrants and yeah. leaders of extremist groups always tell their, their, their games. And the story is that we are deserving of more status but we have it unfairly robbed from us by these people over here. Uh, that is a really seductive story, and, and, and that works on people always. You know, that, that like, you know, all around the world, throughout history, that, that, that has been a powerful story that tyrants and, yeah, uh, have told. And, and people get very kind of whipped up. And that's a story, of course, that was told in the 1930s in, you know, in Germany about the Jewish population. Um, and you know, that's an example of it working you know, on, on a large number of people on a, on a mass scale, and it was, it was that kind of fundamental story. Um, so, 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 yeah, that's the, that's the story that um, the kind of tyrants tell. And I suppose the kinds of people that are going to be attracted to that story are people that do feel disenfranchised, are people that right. do feel that my status has been taken away from me, and it's not fair. Like, and the fairness is the game thing. Like, the, you know, we've got this game that we're playing, and it's not fair because I'm doing everything I should be doing, and yet I'm being disparaged and humiliated, I'm not 
moving on in life as I should be moving on. Mm. So that should be the narcissist factor then a little bit as well. Well, I think it's everybody, but the narcissist, I, I, I think what the narcissism, the grandiosity does is it kind of amplifies those emotions. So if, you, if you're a narcissistic kind of person and you f if you're a normal person and you feel like, oh, you know, I'm doing everything I should, I'm working two jobs and da 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 and yet I turn on the television and everyone's having a go at me, you might vote for Trump. You're a normal person who votes for Trump, right? <laughs> but if you're a narcissist, uh, you might storm the White House because you're furious because it's not like, oh, it's not fair. You're like, I'm amazing and nobody's, you know, like, so, 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 so it amplifies all those emotions. So it's also part of the, like, the unfairness feeling. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I, um, you've also talked about incels, so uh, mm -hmm. involuntary celibates for the audience, if you don't know. Um, and they, of course, have a very uh, particular kind of culture, yep. subculture maybe. Uh, there's a lot of self-hate, there's a lot of misogyny, and there's also some cases of uh, extremist violence. Yes. Um, so what do you think happens there with the incels? Well, I think it's the same thing. I think, you know, in the book I talk, in, I go in depth into this guy, Elliot Roger, who left yeah. this 108,000 word autobiography Thanks, behind him. It was just quite an extraordinary thing. Like, it, it really is kind of gripping um, piece of writing. He had talent. That's just a sad thing. Mm. Um, but he was, um, yeah, he was incredibly narcissistic. Like, unbelievably, he really thought he was, he, he called himself the supreme gentleman. And yet, all these women, you know, um, all these women um, won't go anywhere near me. Um, and he, he, he then moved to, his parents made this terrible decision um, to move him to the University of California, Santa Barbara. And the reason I came across Elliot Rogers is because when I was researching my book, Selfie, uh -huh. I had to go to an archive at that university, and I saw all these kind of shrines to people. So what's going on here? Yeah. I was like, oh my God, there was a spree killing. So, of course, I went back and immediately went on YouTube and, oh, my God. Um, and everybody at University of California, Santa Barbara, is gorgeous. Like, it's just, just, like, it's just like, oh, my God. Um, so, 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 he, so it was the worst place in the world for him to go because he was surrounded by, you know, uh, very attractive young people and felt humiliated. To, you know, and, and he would say he started kind of lashing out and then, of course, got lashed back out by yeah. the jock types, which made it worse. And I mean, it's just, a, and he just spiraled and ended up killing a bunch of people. Mm. But, 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 but he has got that classic triumvirate where he was absolutely narcissistic. He, he's, you can still see his videos on the, on the internet. I mean, he really did think he was something special. Um, he, humiliated again and again and again and again. Um, and it's quite, I, I mean, he was a misogynist and a killer. But, but, but you can't help but feel, feel Bad for him at times, like in his, when you read his book. Uh, um, so the, the, the only way that this guy could get any status in his teenage years was by playing World of Warcraft. That was his thing. Mm -hmm. And um, he became really good at World of Warcraft, like really yeah, like yeah. globally good at World yeah. of Warcraft. <laughs> um, and then he decided that he realized that like, that wasn't cool. Like girls didn't like World of Warcraft players. They're like skateboarders. <laughs> and so he, wouldn't, so he gave it up. Um, but, he, but, he, but he would, um, um, he, he kept going back to it and kept going back to it because he loved it. Uh, and um, one time he found, he, he only had two friends left in the world that he'd play World of Warcraft with. And he found out one day that they were meeting up in secret to play without him. Mm. And he describes just being in floods of tears. And literally the same day, that's when his brain just starts, like... There's something changed. Something changed, and he starts telling these stories about how women are the, like the proper misogynistic hate stuff comes out of him. Yeah. Um, women are the, uh, women are the responsible for all the bad things in the world because they keep procreating with jock types who are violent and what we need to do is control the women, like proper like misogynist Hitler mm. stuff starts happening. And it's on exactly the same day in this book um, that this World of Warcraft incident happened. So I really do think that they're connected, you know, like when his, when he, when his last form of status was, was gone, yeah. He, he, I mean, he had a, just a massive breakdown, as far as I can see. So, with him, it was almost a case of, um, if I interpret it, like externalizing blame. Yes. But uh, what about uh, people who then internalize it? We've also seen uh, much higher rates, for example, of male suicide in yep. society. Yeah. Um, we found a number that was 400% higher in Europe than yep. compared women. to women. Um, what do you think? Anemia as well, going yeah. up by 30% amongst men. So, there's definitely yeah. also internalized yes. self harm happening. Um, what do you think? Is there a connection there between status games and the way they've changed? Well, I don't know about the way they've changed, but like I did this research for Selfie, um, um, looking at suicide and also why particularly 
it affects men. And there, of course, there are lots of reasons. You know, one of them, I'm sure, is that men, just men are more violent, so men are more likely to just hang themselves. Well, you know. Um, but, but the other, uh, 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 another really interesting theory that's sort of dominant at the moment amongst experts is the idea of social perfectionism. Right. So there are all kinds of different forms of perfectionism. But social perfectionism is the one about roles. It's, it's the one about, um, 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 I've got to be perfect in the eyes of everybody else, and if I'm not, I, I've failed. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and I think what, what the, the idea is that, is, that, is that men are more susceptible to social perfectionism. So, so I've failed as a man, I've failed as a husband, I've failed as an employee, I've failed my children. So it, it's, that, it's, it's, that, it's that kind of mindset that seems to impact, especially middle-aged men, because I think when you hit middle age, you start hitting failure a lot more. Right. Is there an idea about why that's the case? About why men are more... I don't know. Not, not as far as I know. The, the, okay. the, when, I, the, the, when I interviewed the experts, there was no kind of... Consensus about consensus why. Consensus about why. I mean, of course, you're, you're always going to get to that endless debate about is it genetic, is it cultural, social, and for me, the answer is usually it's a bit of both, um, but, but I don't know. So then do you think that society kind of as a community, that we're failing to equip men with the tools that they need to help navigate kind of the new expectations that they have in the 21st century? Um, I, don't know the, I don't know if you can say it's a sort of a... I, I, I think if there's a way that we're failing men yeah. who are suicidal and are suffering mental he health issues, is that we're not understanding... You're almost pathologizing masculinity. So there's this... There's this constant refrain where oh, men just don't cry enough, men don't right. talk about their feelings enough. And so, 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 so there's this kind of, oh, it's almost, it feels as if, if people say, well, men need to be a bit more like women are, yeah. otherwise they're failing. And I think, I, I, I think, and this is what, I mean, I'm just repeating what um, Rory O'Connor, who heads up the Suicide Behavior Research Lab in the University of Glasgow, said to me, is that we actually need to be, rather than trying to change men, yeah. we need to be figuring out how men work. And, and helping them on their terms rather than saying, you just need to talk more. Because, you know, right. what, if, what if men don't want to talk more, yeah. you know? <laughs> what would a healthy masculinity be then? A healthy ma oh, that's a, such a big question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the way I think about that is that if, if you look at the way people define, uh, the, you know, toxic masculinity, in inverted commas, people who are kind of too aggressive and too interested in their status and, uh, you, you know... You can, you can imagine healthy versions of all of those, you know, too protective, and you can imagine healthy versions of all of those things. I guess that would be a healthy masculinity, a productive, strong uh, masculinity. So a more balanced version of what we have already. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I think let's turn to the audience for one or two questions as well, just for about five minutes. We have uh, someone in the cap here on the left side from, from our perspective. In the gray sweatshirt. Yeah. Hello. Uh, first of all, really glad that I joined this talk. I really enjoyed it so far. I made my day. <laughs> so my question would be, um, how do you control the status game? When do you think you have to walk away or where, when do you have to play it? And what is the healthy balance? Um, when do you ha walk away? Well, I, I feel like, and again, this is something I wrote more about in Selfie. I, th I think that there's this one of the kind of toxic lies we tell in Western culture is the lie that says you can do anything you want. You just got to dream big enough and believe in yourself. And I, and I know why people tell each other that, especially parents of the children's that, because they want them to succeed and it comes from a good place. But it's really toxic because, it's, because most of the time we don't succeed. Most of the time we fail. And what that means is that when I fail, it's my fault. And, and actually, it isn't. You know, like, genes are real. We're all different. We can't all be Beyonce. We can't all be Michelle Obama. You know. You know I so, 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 so I, I, I think that um, I, I think knowing when to walk away. I, I, you know, I think I, I agree with. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. But if fifth and sixth you don't succeed, then do something else, buddy. Because just <laughs> life is short. You know, like it's about find that thing that you're quite good at and do that thing. Like forget about money and fame. Do that thing that you're quite good at, and then I think that's that's a good good way of kind of organizing your life, as far as I can see. Mm. Mm. One more question in the green. You've been waiting for a while. In the center. Um, yeah, hi, uh, nice talk. I was uh, thinking a lot about like 
uh, when you talk about status, it seems like you mentioned in a spiritual sense, but also a material sense. Uh, and it seems like what I see in society is that women tend to uh, seek out status in uh, relationships and things like this, more like in a social sense, mm. whereas men tend to seek out status in a material sense. Mm. And do you think that this could be caused by the fact that, at least from my perspective, I find that men tend to have less intimate relationships with people where they can really express themselves in, in a healthy way and in a safe way. And I was wondering like, maybe what you thought of that. And then also something else I was thinking about is um, we're sort of, in a good way, we're encouraging women to become more dominant, to mm. seek also status like, you know, like work and all these things uh, and with feminism, all this progress we've seen. How do you see this intertwine with uh, this crisis of masculinity where we're saying men can't be dominant, but women should be encouraged to be. Yes. Um, well, it's, it, 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 it's, it, that's a massive question. We could spend an hour just talking about that. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that, that, again, generally speaking, there are gender differences. Gender differences are real, and, and they have a biological root. And again, it's just that's generally speaking. Um, so, so you can never look at one man or one woman and say, you're like this and you're like this, of course. Um, uh, uh, and I think that, you know, over the last 100 years, of course, we've gone through the kind of feminist, several feminist revolutions, and they've been amazing things, and it's fantastic and wonderful. But like everything, it's a trade-off. Uh, and, and so it has this kind of combination of good effects and, and bad effects. And, and, and some of the bad effects are the, you know, for women, it's this thing of you've got to have it all now. You've got to be not only a great mother and partner, and you've got to look amazing, but you've got to have brilliant careers, and you've got to own your own business, and, you know, that's tough. Um, and, and men have, you know, it's often, often called this kind of crisis of masculinity where, where we kind of live in this culture where we're kind of told often to kind of step back and sit down and be quiet. And I think that's tough on, the, on, on, on a kind of younger generation of men who haven't done anything wrong. They're just trying to succeed in the world. Um, so, 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 yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, y you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a time of kind of, you know, great success and great progress, but also there's some stuff to sort out. And I think we, and I think we need to get better at kind of talking about that stuff without immediately right. accusing people to talk about gender differences of being misogynist and sexist and all that stuff. I think we've still got to get past that um, before we can have a properly healthy conversation about how men and women are going to achieve together and work together and live together <laughs> in, in, a, in a way that's mutually supportive. So it's not just one supporting the other, it's mutually supportive. Mm. Okay, thanks again for the questions. So um, we were also wondering, uh, how are you hoping that people would uh, change the way they interact with status uh, after reading your book? Or did you hope that at all? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean the, the way I've changed is that I've... I've um, I've done that thing of diversifying. Like, like I, I've did that classic thing where, like, my whole life has been just my work. That's it. Mm -hmm. I don't have any children, <laughs> you know. So, I, I, like, so, so it's like it's been completely based on my writing. And then, and doing all the research, like, like I realised that, that a that makes me very vulnerable because if, as is inevitable, my career will go, you know, down because um, that's what happens to careers. <laughs> um, I'm going to be screwed. And, and and it isn't just like, oh no, that's going to be a shame. Ooh. Yeah. It is your identity. Like it's massively important. Your 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 you know your kind of avatar and your status game. That's who you are. So, so when it goes away, that's why you know people who get sacked have such a hard time psychologically. It's not just the income. It's their identity that's been destroyed. So it's really it makes you vulnerable. So I about uh, six months ago I started doing voluntary work, which is something I never would have thought about um, um, before doing this this book. So you did that because of status? Yeah, because. Because it, I, I didn't tell them that because they were thinking, yeah. this <laughs> lunatic. <laughs> but it's like, yeah. but as, uh, you know, like I, I've been working on success status for 30 years. I've got none, no virtue whatsoever. <laughs> I don't do anything for anyone. Uh, and also, you know, I get in a classic middle-aged man. I find myself very isolated and quite lonely. Yeah. Like, I, like all my friends, like, I, like I, you know, like I haven't seen my school friends for 20 years. And so, so this voluntary work has made me feel connected Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's also given me this another source of status, which has nothing to do with public reputation or money or anything like that. And it's, yeah. it's been quite amazing. Like, you know, like I went through a period of training, like these three-hour sessions every Thursday night until 10 o'clock. 
and I kind of dread going to them. But by the end of the thing, I'd be like grinning and feeling like amazing. Mm. And yeah, and so, so yeah, it was, so, so that's kind of changed. That's literally changed my life and it's changed who I am. Um, and it was a kind of completely rational kind of academic, whoa, you know, checklist thing. Well, I, need to, I need to fill in this checkbox. Right. And it really worked. <laughs> like, it's really worked. I'm really enjoying the voluntary work. Like, it's, it's like a whole new world for me to exist in. So, so, so if, if other people can sort of take a bit of that away too, then I think It's nice that then the, the medicine would be to <laughs> do voluntary work. Yeah. Yes. I mean, that's quite <laughs> yeah. a yeah. 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 realization. Yeah. All right, so I think we're just about to wrap up because we do need to... Um, Everybody to leave very quickly. We'll explain why in a second. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess finally, can we ask, what will your next book be about? Okay, so my next book, I, look, my previous book was about storytelling. Yep. And the next book is like about uh, storytelling for business. Okay. So, mm, okay. Not, not very interesting to most people, but it's... Uh, Going into yeah. a specific <laughs> yeah. <one. laughs> yeah. For all of the business people. That's exactly. Yeah. People. Yeah. 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 Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with that, so we thank you so much for being here. And uh, for everyone in the audience... Uh, you can find our interviews on podcast, Apple Podcast, our full-length videos on YouTube. And uh, we also have some interesting interviews coming up next week. On uh, Monday, we have the CEO of Fairphone, Eva Gawens. And that will be at 1 p.m. here at the stage. And then the 30th of January, we have Iranian human rights lawyer, Shadi Sadr. And she will also talk about the situation around. Same thing, 1 p.m. Also, folks, as I teased earlier, this room <laughs> is about to be used by the FEB faculty, so we're going to need to ask all of you to leave as quickly as you possibly can. If you'd like to stay around and help pack up chairs, you're more than welcome to, but unfortunately, there is not the chance to ask further questions. Before you leave, can we please have a warm, warm applause? Yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>